guys, we're gonna do this episode in a different format. We're gonna do it more like a podcast than a video as we normally do. This is because this is part two of the Gospel of the Holy Twelve. Last week we did an introduction to the Gospel of the Holy Twelve where we talked about certain topics that would be coming up in this gospel as well as the lineage and origins of this supposed heretical gospel. Now I myself do not believe that this gospel is heretical. As we said last week, this gospel seems to have escaped the quote-unquote pin of correction from the Council of Nicaea. For this week's episode on the Gospel of the Holy Twelve Part 2, we are going to be going through the first 40 verses of this gospel. This is a very long gospel. Now, if you are just now tuning into Esoteric Atlanta, first of all, welcome. Second of all, I would highly suggest that you go back and watch part one from last week before this episode, part two. I will be placing part one down in the description box below. All right, let's get started. So the first section, section one, is lections one through ten. The first lection is the parentage and conception of John the Baptist. Now some of these verses I am going to skim over because again this is a very, very long gospel and I do highly, highly suggest that everybody read it for themselves. I am using the translation on the website, The Nazarene Way, which I will also put a link to in the description box below. But section one, lection one through ten, the first lection is the parentage and conception of John the Baptist. This tells a story almost identical to the story of the conception of John the Baptist in the canonized Bible. However, we do see in verse 5 an immediate emphasis on vegetarianism. Now again, if you remember from last week, we talked about how the Gospel of the Holy Twelve, along with the Book of Q, were allegedly the original Gospels that the disciples had when they went off and started teaching their own students. Their students who eventually wrote the other Gospels that we have in our Bible and in the lost works of the Bible used the Gospel of the Holy Twelve as well as the Book of Q as their main reference source. With that being said, you will recognize a lot of these stories as being identical to what you had in your canonized Bible. However, the canonized Bible we do know has been altered. It was first altered in the Council of Nicaea and since has has been altered many times thereafter. So in my opinion, because the Gospel of the Holy Twelve was not really touched by the Council of Nicaea, we're getting a more clear view on what the actual teachings of Jesus were back in that time, and vegetarianism is going to play throughout this whole Gospel. And in the first lection regarding the conception of John the Baptist, it does say, And thou shalt have joy and gladness, and many shall rejoice at his birth. For he shall be great in the sight of the Lord, and shall neither eat flesh, meats, or drink strong drink, and he shall be filled with the Holy Spirit even from his mother's womb. The second lection says the Immaculate Conception of Jesus the Christ. Within this, now this is interesting, we see that Joseph is Jesus' father, his biological father, as directed by God. Please remember, if you have been following along on the Dark Outpost with David Zublick on Tuesday nights, we have actually talked about this. When we studied the Canaanites and the Council of Nicaea and Constantine and all the stuff that happened in the origins of the state religion of Christianity, we learned that back at this time, the idea of immaculate conception of being God impregnating Mary himself was considered to be satanic. This was something that gods like Ra or Horus 
that's how they were conceived. And so when Constantine and the Council of Nicaea made this the official story of Jesus as well, it pissed a lot of Christians, early Christians off because they knew that this was not true. And in the Gospel of the Holy Twelve, we see it's not true. We see that God used Joseph as his DNA donor, father, with Mary to create the physical man of Jesus. Please remember that all the Canaanite gods, the satanic gods, came into the world without the use of a man. And we know that Jesus is not a Canaanite god. He is the child of an almighty living God. But in section two, it says, Then Mary said unto the angel, How shall this be, seeing that I know not a man? And the angel answered and said unto her, Thy Holy Spirit shall come upon Joseph thy spouse, and the power of the highest shall oversee thee, O Mary. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Christ, the child of God. And his name on earth shall be called Jesus Maria, for he shall save people from their sins, whoever shall repent and obey his ball. It goes on to say, Therefore ye shall eat no flesh, nor drink strong drink, for the child shall be consecrated unto God from its mother's womb, and neither flesh nor strong drink shall he take. And in the same day the angel Gabriel appeared unto Joseph in a dream, and said unto him, Hail, Joseph, thou art highly favored, for the fatherhood of God is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst men, and blessed be the fruit of thy loins. And as Joseph thought upon these words, he was troubled. And the angel of the Lord said upon him, Fear not, Joseph, thou son of David, for thou hast found favor with God. And behold, thou shalt beget a child, and thou shalt call his name Jesus Maria, for he shall save people from their sins." Then Joseph, being raised from his sleep, did as the angel had bidden him, and went upon Mary his spouse's bride, and she conceived in her womb the Holy One. Now, lection three is the nativity of John the Baptist. Lection four is the nativity of Jesus the Christ. These are pretty similar to the stories found in the canonized Bible. The only difference is in lection four, the nativity of Jesus Christ. I found it very interesting that they talk a lot about how important it was for Jesus to be born amongst the animals. The animals are very important to God. And so Jesus wanted to come into the world next to the animals in his manger. Lection five is the manifestation of Jesus to the Magi. Now we've talked about the Magi on the Dark Outpost. The Magi were priests from the faith of Mithraism, which Mithraism was the Canaanite faith that Constantine, the emperor Constantine was. There's a lot of crossover between Mithraism and the Christianity that we see today. In fact, a lot of the church's holidays are actually based off of Mithraism and not the Christian faith. This is because, again, Constantine used Christianity to his advantage to conquer the Roman Empire. He himself was absolutely never a Christian. He was a practicer of Mithraism. Well, the Magi, again, they were Mithraic priests. They ended up um, becoming servers of Jesus when they saw him. It goes on in this lection five to say, Now when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, there came certain magi men from the east to Jerusalem who had purified themselves and tasted not of flesh nor of strong drink that they might find the Christ whom they sought. And they said, Where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we in the east have seen his star and are come to worship him. It goes on to again talk about animals with the Magi. It says, And they went on their way with their camels and their donkeys laden with gifts and were intent on the heavens seeking this child by the star. They forgot for a little that their beast who had borne the burden and heat of the day and were thirsty and fainting, and the star was hidden from their sight." 
So the fact that they forgot to care for their animals, the star basically disappeared. It goes on to say, in the vein, they stood and gazed and looked one upon the other in their trouble. When they bethought them of their camels and donkeys and hastened to undo their burden that they might have rest. Basically, after the camels and the donkeys had rest, they were able to then see the star again and go on to Jesus. Lection six is childhood and youth of Jesus the Christ. He delivereth a lion from the hunters. It says now Joseph and Mary, his parents, went to up to Jerusalem every year at the feast of Passover. And they observed the feast after the manner of their brethren who abstained from bloodshed and eating of the flesh and from strong drink. And when he was 12 years old, he went to Jerusalem with them after the custom of the feast. And in 18 years of age, Jesus was espoused unto Miriam, a virgin of the tribe of Judah, with whom he lived seven years. And she died. For God took her that he might go on to the higher things which he had to do and to suffer for the sons and daughters of men. In this, we also see many miracles of Jesus as a child, like bringing doves back to life as well as making flowers grow where there were none to begin with. We also see missing years. According to the gospel, during the time not mentioned in the canonized Bible, Jesus went all over studying. He was in Egypt, India, and Persia. He learned about rocks and herbs as well as stars and the universe as a whole. It is also recorded that he fasted a lot. And of course, as I just read, he was married to a woman named Miriam. So obviously not Mary Magdalene, even though Miriam is a name for Mary. He was married to this woman for seven years and then he died so that Jesus or she died rather excuse me so that Jesus could go on and fulfill his prophecy it goes on to say and none shall hurt or destroy in my holy mountain so this is Jesus talking for the earth shall be full of knowledge of the holy one even as the waters cover the bed of the sea and in the that that Day, I will make again a covenant with the beasts of the earth and the fowl of the air and the fishes of the sea and with all created things and will break the bow and the sword of all the instruments of warfare will I banish from the earth and will make them lie down in safety to live without fear. And on a certain day, he was passing by a mountainside night unto the desert. There he met a lion and many men were pursuing him with stones and javelins to slay him. But Jesus rebuked them, saying, Why hunt ye these creatures of God, which are more noble than you? By the cruelties of many generations, they were made the enemies of man who should have been his friends. If the power of God is shown in them, so also is shown his long and suffering compassion. Cease ye to persecute this creature who desireth not to harm you. See you not how he fleeth from you and is terrified by your violence? And the lion came and lay at the feet of Jesus and showed love to him. And the people were astonished and said, Lo, this man loveth all creatures and have power to command even these beasts from the deserts, and they obey him. Lection number seven is the preaching of John the Baptist. And to all he spoke, saying, Keep yourself from blood and things strangled and from dead bodies of the birds and the beasts, and from all deeds of cruelty, and from all that is gotten of wrong. Think ye the blood of beasts and birds will wash away sin? I tell you, nay, speak the truth, be just, be merciful to one another and to all creatures that live and walk humbly with your God." So as I'm saying, this whole idea of vegetarianism and not being cruel to the animals of the earth is heavily, heavily spoken about throughout this gospel. We know in the Gnostic gospels, this is also a very common theme that these animals that we see around us are our responsibility to take care of and to love as we do our own brothers and sisters. Lection number eight is the baptism of Jesus Maria the Christ, which is also spoken about in the canonized Bible. And number nine, lection nine is the four temptations. Again, also spoken about in the canonized Bible. 
Lection 10 is Joseph and Mary make a feast unto Jesus. Andrew and Peter find Jesus. It says, and when he had returned from the wilderness after he was fasting and was in his temptations, the same day his parents made him a feast and they gave unto him the gifts with the met with the with which the Magi had presented him in his infancy. So Mary and Joseph had saved all those gifts that were presented to Jesus at his birth and they were given to him on his feast day. And Mary said, these things we have kept for thee even to this day. And she gave unto him the gold and the frankincense and the mirth. And he took the frankincense, but the gold he gave unto his parents for the poor. And the myrrh he gave unto Mary, who is called the Magdalene. So this is when we start to meet Mary Magdalene, when we go into section two, as we are going into section two right now. So section two is lections 11 through 20. Lections 11 is the anointing of Mary Magdalene. Now there is a, a famous saying, I think it actually got started during World War II, that if you tell a lie, many, many times it eventually becomes the truth. And we've talked about Mary Magdalene from her gospel on this channel before, as well as on David's channel. And we know that Mary Magdalene was not a prostitute. We know that that was a weird story that got started in uh, the middle, like the 500s with a Pope. And if you look in the canonized Bible, you definitely see that it is another woman from Magdala, which was where Mary was from. That was the woman that washed Jesus' hair, or foot with her hair and her tears. Well, it seems here that when the um, people were translating this book back in 1870, when they found the copy in the Thai Tibetan monastery, they, car they carried that lie into this translation. And so this is probably one of the few areas of the gospel that is mistranslated. In fact, I have it written in my notes that because the first translation happened in the late 1800s, it is believed that this is mistranslated as the reference for the men in the translation or was the canonized Bible. This story is simply referring to someone from Magdala with no reference to it actually being Mary the Magdalene. It is now believed that this is not the woman we know as Mary Magdalene, but another woman completely. So lecture number 12 is the marriage in Cana, the healing of the nobleman's son. Very, again, very similar to what happened in the canonized Bible. Section 13, the first sermon in the synagogue of Nazareth, very similar to the Bible. And section 14, the calling of Andrew and Peter, the teaching of cruelty to animals. And it goes on to say, and as Jesus was going with some of his disciples, he met with a certain man who trained dogs to hunt other creatures. And he said to the man, why dost thou thus? And the man said, by this I live, and what profit is there to any in, in these creatures? These creatures are weak, but the dogs, they are strong. And Jesus said, thou lackest wisdom and love. Lo, every creature which God hath made, its end and purpose. And who can say, what good is there in that? Or what profit to thyself or mankind? It goes on to say, For thy living, behold the fields yielding their increase, and the fruit-bearing trees and the herbs. What needest thou more than these which honest work of thy hands will not give to thee? Woe to the strong who misuse their strength. Woe to the hunters, for they shall be hunted." It's interesting, he goes on in this verse to talk about how dogs should be trained to help people, which we do see nowadays. We see seeing eye dogs and service dogs that actually help people. They should not be trained to hunt. Jesus is very, he's very adamant about that and throughout this whole gospel, which we'll get into even more stuff where he talks, talks about not hunting. Don't be cruel to other animals. Don't train other animals to hunt as well. Lection 15 says the healing of the leopard, the deaf man who denied that others could hear. This is really a very powerful part of this lection. It says, and as Jesus was going into a certain village, there he met him a man who was deaf from his birth. And he believed not in the sound of the rushing wind or the thunder or the cries of the beast or the birds which complained of their hunger or their hurt, nor that others heard of them. So he didn't believe anybody else could hear either because he couldn't hear. 
And it goes on and says, And Jesus breathed into his ears, and they were open, and he heard. And he rejoiced with exceeding joy in the sounds he before denied. And he said, Now I hear all things. But Jesus said unto him, How sayest thou, I hear all things? Canst thou hear the sighing of the prisoner? or the language of the birds or the beast when they commune with each other, or the voice of the angels and spirits, think how much thou cannot hear and be humbled in thy lack of knowledge. Great little lesson on humility, right? Like we think we can, we think we know everything, but we don't know everything. Just like this man who was deaf and then could hear, thought he could all of a sudden hear everything, but Jesus is pointing out, no, you can't. So just be humble in the lack of knowledge that you actually have. Number 16 is the calling of Matthew, parable of the new wine in the bottles. And number seven is Jesus sends for the 12 and their fellows. It says, and Jesus went up into a mountain to pray. And when he had called unto him his 12 disciples, he gave them power against unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all manner of sickness and all manner of disease. Now the names of the 12 apostles are who stood for the 12 tribes of Israel. And I said this on David's channel. I don't know if that's actually in the canonized Bible because that was new to me. Maybe I just missed it as a kid growing up, but how cool is that? They're the 12 who stood for the 12 tribes of Israel. And Judah Iscariot, who betrayed him, who was also among them, but he was not one of them. So there we go. Number 18, Jesus sended forth the two and 70. And again, Jesus said unto them, be merciful. So shall ye obtain mercy, forgive others, for shall ye be forgiven. With what measures ye meet, with the shall be meted unto you. As ye do unto others, so shall it be done to you. As ye give, so shall it be given unto you. And as ye judge others, so shall ye be judged. And as you serve others, so shall ye be served. For God is just and rewardeth everyone according to their works. That which they sow, they shall also reap. So that's basically the laws of karma, right? If you want to be treated nicely, treat others nicely. If you want to be forgiven, then forgive others. If you want mercy, then show mercy to others as well. Lection 19, Jesus teaches how to pray. This is interesting because this is a very different prayer than what we have in our canonized Bible. Jesus teaches us to pray in this manner. Our Father, Mother, who art above and within, hallowed be thy name in twofold trinity. In wisdom, love, and equanimity, thy kingdom come to all. Thy will be done as heaven, so in earth. Give us day by day to partake in thy holy bread and the fruit of the living vine. As thou dost forgive us our trespasses, so may we forgive others who trespass against us. Spew unto us thy goodness, and to others we may spew the same. In the hour of our temptation, deliver us from evil. Spew upon us thy goodness, and to others we may spew the same. In the hour of our temptation, deliver us from evil. Interesting, he says that twice, right? Like, be as good to us as we are to other people. Help help remind us to be good to other people so that we may, again, experience that mercy from you. And when we are in an hour of our temptation, when our when we're vulnerable and our, we're down, please deliver us out of that evil. It goes on to say, and wheresoever there are seven gathered together in my name, there I am in the midst of ye. If only there are three or two, and while there is but one who prayeth in secret, I am with the one. So it doesn't matter if there's seven people together praying, God is there. If there are two or three, God is there. If there is the one person that is seeking out God, God is with that person. Lection 20 is the return of the two and 70. Blessed are ye of the inner circle who hear my word and whom mysteries are revealed, who give to no innocent creature the pain of prison or of death, but seek the good of all, for such is everlasting life. Blessed are ye who abstain from all things gotten by bloodshed and death and fulfill all righteousness. And with that, we're moving to section three.
Section 3 of the Gospel of the Holy Twelve is Lection 21 through 30. Lection 21 is Jesus rebuketh cruelty to a horse, commandeth the service of Mammon. Now, I had to look up what Mammon is. Mammon is wealth regarded as an evil influence or a false object of worship or devotion. It says, And it came to pass that the Lord departeth from the city and went over the mountains with his disciples. And they came to a mountain whose ways were steep, and there they found a man with a beast of burden. But the horse had fallen down, for it was overladen, and he struck it till the blood flowed. And Jesus went to him and said, Son of cruelty, why strikest thou thy beast? Seest thou not that it is too weak for its burden, and knowest thou not that it is suffering? But the man answered and said, What hast thou to do with it? I may strike it as much as it pleaseth me, for it is mine own, and I bought it with a goodly sum of money. Ask them who are with thee, for they are of mine acquaintance, and they know thereof. And some of the disciples answered and said, Ye, Lord, it is as he saith, we have seen when he bought it. And the Lord said again, See you not then how it bleedeth, and hear ye not how it is waileth? But they answered and said, Nay, Lord, we hear not that it waileth. And the Lord was sorrowful and said, Woe unto you because of the dullness of your hearts. Ye hear not how it entertaineth and crieth unto the heavenly creature for mercy. But thrice woe unto him against whom it crieth and waileth in its pain. And he went forth and he touched it and the horse stood up and its wounds were healed. And to the man he said, Go now thy way and strike it henceforth no more. For thou also desireth to find mercy. And seeing the people come unto him, Jesus said unto his disciples, Because of the sick, I am sick. Because of the hungry, I am hungry. Because of the thirsty, I am athirst. He also said, I am come to end the sacrifice and feast of blood. And if you cease not offering and eating of flesh and blood, the wrath of God shall not cease from you. Even as it came to your fathers in the wilderness who lust for flesh and they eat to their content and were filled with rottenness and the plague consumed them. If therefore you have not been faithful in the mammon of unrighteousness, who will commit to your trust the true riches? And if you have not been faithful in that which is another's man, who shall give you that which is your own? No servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold on to the one and despite the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. And the Pharisees also, who were covetous and heard all these things, and they deride him. Lection 22, the restoration of the daughter. And behold, there cometh one of the rulers of the synagogue. And when he saw him, he fell at his feet and he besought him greatly saying, my little daughter is at the point of death. I pray thee, come and layeth thy hands on her that she may be healed and she shall live. And Jesus went with him and much people followed him and thronged him. And a certain woman, which had an issue of blood 12 years and had suffered many things of many physicians, had spent all she had and was not better but rather grew worse. And she had heard of Jesus, and she came in and pressed behind and touched his garment. For she said, If I may touch but his garment, I shall be whole. Fine, straight away the fountain of her blood was dried up, and she felt her body that she was healed of the plague. So this is very similar to a story from the canonized Bible of the woman who touched the garment. This woman obviously had a blood condition and had been sick for a very long time. And the physicians, the doctors could not make her better. She was growing worse. And the minute she touched Jesus' garment, she instantly got better. It goes on to say, and Jesus immediately knowing in himself that the virtue had gone out of him, turned him about in the press and said, who touched my vesture? And his disciples said unto him, thou seest the multitude thronging thee and saith thou who touched me? 
And he looked around about to see her that had done this thing. But this woman, fearing and trembling, knowing what was done in her, came and fell down before him and told him all the truth. And he said unto her, Daughter, thy faith had made thee whole. Go in peace and be whole of thy plague. So we're going to see that now in this, we get further into this gospel, that it's not just the power of God or Jesus that heals us, but it's also the faith that we have in God and Jesus that also heals us. And yet while he spoke, there came the ruler of the synagogue's house, certain which he said, my daughter is dead. Why troublest thou the master any further? As soon as Jesus heard the word that was spoken, he said unto the ruler of the synagogue, be not afraid, only believe. And he suffered no man to follow him, save Peter and James and John, the brother of James. And he came to the house of the ruler of the synagogue, and he saw the tumult and minstrels, and them that had laideth and wailed greatly. And when he was come in, he said unto them, Why make ye this ado and weep? The damsel is not dead, but sleepeth. And they laughed at him to scorn, for they thought she was dead and believed him not. But when he had put them all out, he taketh two of his disciples with him and entered in where the damsel was lying. And he took the damsel by the hand and said unto her, I say unto thee, arise. And straightway the damsel arose and walked. And she was of the age of 12. And they were astonished with great astonishment. And he charged them slightly that no man should make it known and command that something should be given to her to eat. So now we're going to go down to section 23, which is Jesus and the Samaritan woman. This is almost identical to the story from the canonized Bible in John 4, 4 through 26. In a lot of places, this is actually word for word, which again makes sense seeing that the students of the early church use this gospel as a source to write the other gospels. We go down to section 24th, which is Jesus denounces cruelty and he healeth the sick. As Jesus passed through a certain village, he saw a crowd of idlers of the basser sort, and they were tormenting a cat, which they had found and were shamefully treating. And Jesus commanded them to desist and began to reason with them. But they would have none of his words and reviled him. Then he made a whip of knotted cords and drove them away, saying, This earth which my father, mother made for joy and gladness, you have made into the lowest hell with your deeds of violence and cruelty. And they fled before his face." But one more vile than the rest returned and defied him. And Jesus put forth his hand, and the young man's arm weathered. And great fear came upon all, and he said, He is a sorcerer. And the next day the mother of the young man came unto Jesus, praying that he would restore his withered arm. And Jesus spoke unto them, For the law of love and the unity of all life is one family of God. And he also said, as you do in this life to your fellow creatures, so shall it be done to you in the life to come. And the young man believed and confessed his sins, and Jesus stretched forth his hand, and his withered arm became whole even as the other. And the people glorified God, who had given such power unto the man." So Jesus basically like got really upset that these young boys were like torturing this cat. He got a whip and started beating them off the cat. So we obviously see over and over and over again that Jesus values the life of animals just as he values the life of humans. And again, as human beings, it is our responsibility to care for these animals, to not hurt them, to not eat them, but to see them as living beings created by God. In the rest of the chapter, we see Jesus performing miracle after miracle after miracle upon the sick. Lection 25 is the Sermon on the Mount, part one. It says, Jesus, seeing the multitudes, went up into the mountain. And when he was seated, the twelve came unto him, and he lifted up his eyes unto his disciples and said, Blessed in spirit are the poor, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. 
Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are they who do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Ye blessed are ye when men shall hate you, and when they shall separate you from their company, and shall reproach you, and cast out your name as evil. For the Son of Man's sake, rejoice ye in the day, and leap for joy, for behold, your reward is great in the heaven. For it is like the manner did their fathers unto the prophets. Woe unto you that are rich, for ye have received in this life your consolation. Woe unto you that are full, for ye shall hunger. Woe unto you that laugh now, for ye shall mourn and weep. Woe unto you when all men shall speak well of you, for so did their fathers to the false prophets. Ye are the salt of the earth, for every sacrifice must be salted with salt. But if the salt have lost its savior, wherewith shall it be salted? It is thenceforth good for nothing, but to be cast out and to be trodden under foot. Ye are the light of the world. A city that is built on a hill cannot hide. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick. And it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may seek your good works and glorify your parent, parent with a capital P, meaning God, who is in heaven. Think that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one title shall in no way pass from the law or the prophets till all be fulfilled. But behold, one greater than Moses and one is spelled with a capital O, so God, one greater than Moses is here. And he will give you the higher law, even the perfect law, and this law ye obey. Whoever therefore shall break one of these commandments, which he shall give and shall teach men so, they shall be called the least in the kingdom. But whoever shall do and teach them the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Verily they who believe and obey shall save their souls, and they who obey not shall lose them. For I say unto you, that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, ye shall not enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, if thou bring thy gift to the altar, and thy brother hath thou against thee, Leave there thy gift before the altar and go thy way. First be reconciled to thy brother and then come and offer thy gift. Agree with thine adversaries quickly while thou art in the way with him. Least at any time thy adversary deliver thee to the judge and the judge deliver thee to the officer and thou be cast in prison. Verily I say unto thee, thou shalt by no means come out of thence till thou hast paid the uttermost farthing. Ye have heard that it hath been said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thy enemy. But I say unto you which here love your enemies, do good to them which you hate. Bless them that curse you and pray for them which despitefully use you. And ye may be the children of your parent who maketh the sun to rise and the evil and the good and sendeth rain on the just and the unjust. For if you love them which love you, what thank have ye? For sinners also love those that love them. And if you do good to teach them, do good to you, what thank ye have? For sinners even do the same. And if you salute your brethren only, what do ye more than others? Do not even so as tax gatherers. And if a desire be upon the as thy life, and it turn thee from thy truth, cast it out of thee. For it is better to enter life possessing truth than losing it to be cast out into other darkness. And if that seem desirable to thee, which cost another pain or sorrow, cast it out of thine heart. So shalt thou attain peace. Better it is to endure sorrow than to inflict it on those who are weaker. But ye therefore perfect, even as your parent who is in heaven is perfect. 
section 26 is the Sermon on the Mount, part two. We're gonna actually skip down to verse three and start there. And when thou prayest, thou shall not be as the hypocrites are, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the corners of the streets that they may be seen of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. But thou, when thou prayest, enter in thy chamber, and when thou hast shut thy door, pray to thy father and mother, who is in secret. And the secret one, one with a capital O again, as God, that seeth in secret shall approve thee openly. That's interesting, right? Like we think about all these celebrity pastors and preachers today, and he's basically being like, don't be these people. Like just, just have your faith privately. Don't make a show out of your faith, right? He says, and when ye pray in common, use not vain petitions as the heathens do, for they think that they shall be heard for their much speaking. Be not ye therefore like unto them, for your heavenly parent knoweth what things ye have need of. Before you ask after this manner, therefore pray ye when you are gathered to get it together. And in verse six, he actually goes over the um, Lord's Prayer again, just like we talked about earlier. Our parent, instead of saying Father, Mother, he now says our parent with a capital P, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us day by day our daily bread and the fruit of the living vine. As thou forgivest us our trespasses, so may we forgive the trespasses of others. Leave us not in temptation, deliver us from evil. Amen. For if ye forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly parent will also forgive you. But if ye forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your parent in heaven forgive you your trespasses. From here, we're going to go down to verse 14, where it says, No man can serve two masters again. We've heard this once before. Now we're hearing it again. And if you remember, this is also from the Gospel of Mary, where she talks about the mind. The human mind cannot serve two masters. It can even either serve the spirit or it can serve the um, the the nature world, the matter, the body, the stuff that's not permanent. So again, verse 14 starts, no man can serve two masters for either he will hate the one and love the other or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. Ye cannot serve God and mammon. Therefore I say unto you, be not over anxious for your life, what ye shall eat or what ye shall drink, nor yet for your body, what ye shall put on. It is not the life more than meat and the body than remnant. And what shall it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his life? The Lament 27 is the Sermon on the Mount, part three. It again starts off, judge not that ye be not judged. My mother used to say that just all the time. Judge not, lest ye be judged. For with that judgment ye judge, and ye shall be judged. And with the measures ye meet, it shall be measured to you again. And as you do unto others, so shall it be done unto you. Down at verse 4, it says, Ask, and it shall be given to you. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. For every one that asketh receiveth, and he that seeketh findeth. And to them that knocked it shall be opened. And then jumping down to verse eight, it says, beware of false prophets for which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. Ye shall know that them by their fruits, do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles. This is such a lesson that we still need today. How many people are falling for the, are fell for the promise of the deep state or the cabal. And now that we have the, um, shadow president, the fake president in office, we're seeing all these people getting laid off. We're seeing the wolf in the sheep's clothing that is the deep state. It's a lesson we all need to keep held on into our hearts even to this day. So we're going to skip down into section 28. Jesus releases the rabbit and the pigeons. It came to pass on the day as Jesus had finished his discourse in a place near the Tiberias, where there were seven wells, a certain young man brought live rabbits and pigeons that meat he might have to eat with his disciples. And Jesus looked on the young man with love and said to him, Thou hast a good heart, and God shall give thee light. But knowest thou not that God in the beginning gave to man the fruits of the earth and did not make him lower than the ox or the horse or the sheep, that he should kill and eat the flesh and blood of his fellow creatures? Ye believe that Moses indeed commanded such creatures to be 
slain and offered in sacrifice and eaten. And so do you do in the temple. But behold, a greater than Moses is herein, and he cometh to put away the bloody sacrifices of the law and the feast on them, and to restore you to the pure and unbloody sacrifice as in the beginning, even the grains and the fruits of the earth. Now, um, again, here we come back to the idea of giving animals as a sacrifice and eating them. And it's interesting, I um, know somebody through yoga who is a doctor and on Facebook, he often puts up articles that scientists might have been wrong about our origins, that maybe our ancient ancestors were actually not meat eaters. That might have been introduced later on in our existence, the eating of meat. I mean, we think about the appendix. Um, we don't use our appendix anymore, but the appendix was used to help us digest things like barks that were really hard on the digestive system. Now, it is a good thing we don't use our appendix anymore because I don't have my appendix, so there's that. It goes on to say, that which ye offer unto God in purity shall ye eat, but that of kind which ye offer not in purity shall ye not eat. For the hour cometh when your sacrifices and feast of blood shall cease, and ye shall worship God with a holy worship and purity. Let these creatures therefore go th free, and they may rejoice in God and bring no guilt to man. And the young man set them free, and Jesus broke their cages and their bounds. But lo, they feared lest they should again be taken captive, and they went not away from him. But he spoke unto them and dismissed them, and they obeyed his word and departed in gladness. So I guess it's talking about animals having some PTSD that they're going to be captured again, right? And used for sacrifice. And so Jesus brought calmness to them and set them free again. Now, section 29 is interesting to me. When I first started reading this gospel, I thought a lot about the story of from the Bible of Jesus feeding the 5,000 people with the fish and the bread. And I wonder if they were gonna cover this in the Gospel of the Holy 12, and if so, how would they explain the feeding of fish when Jesus is so abnet that they not eat meat? Well, it turns out that in the Gospel of the Holy 12, they're not eating fish. That must have been altered in our canonized Bible. Uh, section 29 is the feeding of the 5,000 with six loaves and seven clusters of grape and healing the six. So we go down to verse six. He saith unto them, how many lo loaves have ye go and see? And when they knew, they said six loave and seven clusters of grapes. And he commanded them to make all sit down by companies of 50 upon the grasses. And they sat down in ranks by hundreds and by fifties. And when he took the six loaves and the seven clusters of grapes, he looked up to the heavens and blessed and broke the loaves and the grapes also and gave them to his disciples to set before them and they divided them among them all. And they did all eat and were filled and they took up the 12 baskets full of fragments that were left and they, and they that did eat the loaves and the fruit were about 5,000 men, women, and children, and he taught them many things. I heard one commentator say that basically Jesus gave them dinner and a show. You know, he made all this food appear and there was no meat to be seen. So again, that must have been altered into our canonized Bible. Verse 11 said, The third watch of the night, Jesus went unto them, walking on the sea. And the disciples saw him walking on the sea, and they were troubled, saying, is it a spirit? And then they cried out of fear. For straightway Jesus spoke unto them, saying, Be of good cheer, it is I, be not afraid. So this is when Jesus was walking on water. And Peter answered and said, Lord, if it be thou, bid me come unto thee on the water. And he said, Come. But when Peter was to come down out of the ship, he walked unto the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw the winds blowing, he was afraid and began to sink. He cried, saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched forth his hand and caught him and said unto him, Thee of little faith, why does that thou doubt? For did I not call thee? And we, he went up into them into the ship, and the wind ceased, and they were all sorely amazed in themselves beyond measure and wonder, for they considered not the miracle of the loaves and the fruit, for their heart was hardened. So basically, even though they had just experienced this miracle where Jesus created all this 
food out of bread and fruit, they started doubting again. Their hearts still became hardened. And that's so like human beings, right? Like we experience this one miraculous event of faith and we remember it and we're so changed by it. But then over time, we start to harden our hearts again. And this is the same thing that happened with Peter when he tried to walk out onto the water to see Jesus. Here we go to section 30, the bread of life and the living vine. In verse five, it says, and then Jesus said unto them, verily, verily, I say unto you, Moses gave you not the true bread from heaven, but my parent, parent with a capital P, giveth you the true bread from heaven and the fruit of the living vine. For the food of God is that which cometh down from heaven and giveth life unto the world. Then said they unto him, Lord, evermore give us this bread and this fruit. And Jesus said unto them, I am the true bread, I am the living vine, and they that come to me shall never hunger, and they that believe on me shall never thirst. And verily I say unto you, except ye eat the flesh and drink the blood of God, ye have no life in ye. But ye have seen me and not and believe not. In all that my parent hath given to me shall come to me, and they that come to me I will in no wise cast out. For I came down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of God who sent me. And this is the will of God who hath sent me, that all of which are given unto me I should lose none, but should rise them up and give again at the last day. And the Jews then murmured at him because he said, I am the bread which cometh down from heaven. And they said, is, it is not this Jesus, the son of Joseph and Mary, whose parentage we know. How is it then that he said, I came it down from heaven? And so a part of the Jewish people who had this prophecy in their Torah and their Old Testament, the Hebrew Bible, that they knew a Messiah was coming. Now they're confused because this Messiah came through human beings, not from the sky. He came through the birth canal, which we see again now in the second coming of Jesus. Many Christians are also confused about this. They think the second coming of Jesus is going to be coming from the heaven when it literally is also he will return again through a birth canal as a human being. It goes on to say, Jesus therefore answered and said unto them, murmur ye not among yourselves. None can come to meet me except holy love and wisdom draw them. And ye shall rise at the last day. It is written in the prophets, they shall all be taught of God. Every man therefore that hath heard and hath learned of the Torah cometh unto me. Not that anyone hath seen at this time, save that which are the holiest, they alone see the holiest. Verily, verily, I say unto you, they who believe the truth have everlasting life. So here we now move into section four, lections 31 through 40. Lection 31 is the bread of life and the living vine. In this chapter, Jesus speaks of the corruption of meat, eating meat and sacrificing animals to the same life. He is making clear that he is the only sacrifice to bring life. That's pretty powerful, right? Like we got to stop hurting animals. He's the only life that is worthy to be sacrificed. Verse five says, but they who eat this flesh and drink this blood dwell in me and I in them as the father mother of life hath sent me and by whom I live so that they eat of me who am the truth and the life even shall they live by me. Verse seven says, when Jesus knew in himself that his disciples murmured at it, he said unto them, doth this offend you? What if ye shall see the son and daughter of man ascend to where they were before? It is in the spirit that quicketh, and the flesh and blood profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are the spirit and they are life. Again, this is going back to the Gnosis, the Gnostics, right? Like he's saying, your spirit came from heaven. Your spirit came from the eternal God, not your body. Again, as we said last week in the book of Genesis, when it says that God made man after God's image, he wasn't talking about the physical body. He was talking about that flash of consciousness, that anointing of knowing. In verse eight, it says, but there are some of you that believe not for Jesus knew from the beginning who they were and who should believe not and who should betray him. Therefore, he said unto them, no one can come unto me except it were given from above. 
From that time, many of his disciples went back and walked no more with them. And then Jesus said unto the twelve, will ye also go away? So we know that Jesus had way more than twelve disciples, and here that is, that is verifying that. Then Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life, and we believe and we are sure that thou art the, that Christ, a son of a living God. In verse 11, Jesus answers, have I not chosen you 12 and one also who is a traitor? <laughs> he spoke of Judas Iscariot, for it is he that would betray him. And Jesus was traveling to Jerusalem and there came a camel heavy laden with wood and the camel could not drag it up the hill. Whether he went for the weight thereof, and the driver beat him and cruelly treated him, but he could not make him go further. So again, we see somebody beating his, his horse or his, his donkey, his oxen, you know, this is not good. Jesus does not like this. And Jesus seeing this said unto him, wherefore beast thou brother? So he's referring to the animals as our brothers and sisters. And the man answered, I am not that he is my brother. Is he not a beast of burden and made to serve me? And Jesus said, hath not the same God made of the same substance, the camel and thy children who serve thee? And have ye not one breath of life, which ye both received from God? Wow, that's so powerful. God created the animals in the same substance that he created the humans, and he breathed the breath of life into animals just as he breathes the breath of life into humans. And the man marveled much at this saying, and he ceased from beating the camel and took off some of the burden. And the camel walked up the hill as Jesus went before him and stopped no more until he ended his journey. And the camel knew Jesus, having felt the love of God in him. And the man inquired further of the doctrine, and Jesus taught him gladly, and he became his disciple. Lection 32 says, God, the food and drink of all. And it came to pass, as he sat at supper with his disciples, one of them said unto him, Master, how sayest thou that thou wilt give thy flesh to eat and thy blood to drink? For it is hard saying unto many. And Jesus answered and said, The words which I spoke unto you are spirit and they are life. To the ignorant and carnally minded, they savor of bloodshed and death, but blessed are they who understand." We'll skip down to verse 8. As the corn and the grapes are transfused into flesh and blood, so must your natural minds be changed into spiritual. Seek ye the transmutation of the natural into the spiritual. Very Gnostic, isn't it? Very, very much like the Gnostic text. And verse 9 says, Verily I say unto you, in the beginning all creatures of God did find their substance in the herbs and the fruits of the earth alone, till the ignorance and the selfishness of man turned away of many of them from the use of which God had given them to that which they are contrary to their original use. But even these shall yet return to their natural food, as it is written in the prophets, for their words shall not fail. So again, as I said earlier, I know that there are people out there that believe that our ancient ancestors didn't eat meat, that they were um, herbivores. They were eating of the fruits of the earth. And eventually over time, meat eating got introduced to our diets. Section 33, by the shedding of the blood is no remission of sin. Jesus was teaching his disciples in the outer court of the temple, and one of them said unto him, Master, it is said by the priest that without the shedding of blood there is no remission. Can then the blood offering of the law take away sin? And Jesus answered, No blood offering of beast or bird or man can take away sin. For how can the conscious be purged from sin by shedding of innocent blood? Nay, it will increase the condemnation. So that's interesting, right? We know a lot about what's happening on these islands, but it's just making them even worse and even more defiled. Verse 7 says, But they have made the house of prayer a den of thieves. And for the pure Abolation with incest, they have polluted my altars with blood and eaten of flesh of the slain. But I say unto you, shed no innocent blood, nor eat ye flesh. Walk uprightly, love mercy, and do justly, and your day shall be long in the land. 
Lection 34 is love of Jesus for all creatures. We open with Jesus having to leave Judea for Galilee because he's now causing issues with the Pharisee. It makes note that it is more of a, he is more of a troublemaker than John the Baptist. It's kind of humorous if you read it. He's like, he's baptizing more people than John the Baptist. Therefore, the Pharisees are rather annoyed. And so Jesus has to leave. We also see him starting to work closely with Mary Magdalene. Jesus also takes on a cat that is hungry and weak and then gives it to one of his female disciples to care for. And in verse 9 it says, And some of the people said, This man careth for all creatures. Are they his brothers and sisters that he should love them? And he said unto them, Verily, these are your fellow creatures. For the great household of God, ye, they are your brethren and sisters, having the same breath of life in the eternal. Verse 10 says, And whoever careth for one of the last of these, and giveth to eat and drink in its need, and the same doeth unto me. And those willingly suffereth one of these to be in want, in definition, is not when evilly entreated, suffereth the evil has done unto me. For ye have done this in life, so shall it be done unto you in the life to come. Basically, like, if you're mean to animals, you're basically being mean to Jesus. You know, how you treat other living things is how you also treat Jesus. And that makes sense because God is in all living things. Lection 35 is the good law, Mary and Martha. And behold, a certain law lawyer stood up and tempted him, saying, Master, what shall I do to gain eternal life? And he said unto him, What is written in the law? How readest thou? And he answered, saying, Thou shalt not do unto others as thou wouldst do, and that they should do more unto thee. Thou shalt love thy God with all thy heart and all thy soul and all thy mind. Thou shalt do unto others as thou wouldst what they should do unto thee. And he said unto him, Thou hast answered right. This do, and thou shalt live on these three commandments. Hang all the law and the prophets who loveth God and loveth his neighbor also. But he willing to justify him said, said unto Jesus, and who is my neighbor? And Jesus answered, said, a certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves, which stripped him of his raiment and wounded him and departed, leaving him half dead. And by chance there came down a certain priest that way. And when he saw him, he passed by on the one side. And likewise, others also came and looked on him and passed by on the other side. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion on him, and went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring in oil and wine, and set him on his own beast, and brought him to an inn, and took care of him. And on the morrow, when he departed, he took out two pence, and gave them to the host, and said, Take care of him, whatever thou spendest more, when I can come again, and I will repay thee. Which now of these three, thinkest thou, was neighbor unto him, and fell among thieves? And he said, He that showed mercy on him. And then Jesus said to him, Go and do thou likewise. Now it came to pass, as they went, that he entered into a certain village, and a woman named Martha received him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary, who also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. But Martha was cumbered about much serving and came to him saying, Lord, dost thou not care that my sister hath left me to serve alone? Bid her therefore that she may help me. And Jesus answered and said unto him, her, Martha, Martha, thou art careful and troubled about many things, but one thing is needed and Mary hath chosen that good part, which shall not be taken away from her. So basically Mary was, um, the right there to sit and listen to the word of Jesus instead of running around trying to get everything ready. Again, as Jesus sat at supper with his disciples in a certain city, he said unto them, as a table set upon 12 pillars, so am I in the midst of you. Verily I say unto you, wisdom buildeth her house and heweth out her 12 pillars. She doth prepare her bread and oil and mingle her wine. She doth furnish her table. And she standeth upon the high place of the city and cried to the sons and the daughters of men, whoever will let them turn in hither, let them eat my bread and take of my oil and drink of my wine. Forsake the foolish and live and go in the way of understanding. The veneration of God is the beginning of wisdom and the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. By me shall your days be multiplied and the year of your life shall be increased. 
Now, lection 36 is the woman taken into adultery. Um, this is the story uh, very similar to the one that's in the Bible. It's basically the one where he says, ye who is out without sin may cast the first stone. Lection 37, the regeneration of the soul. Jesus sat in the porch of the temple and some came to learn his doctrine. And he said unto them, master, what teachest thou concerning life? And he said unto them, blessed are they who suffer many experiences for they shall be made perfect through suffering. They shall be the angels of God is heaven and shall die no more. Neither shall they be born anymore for death and birth have no dominion over them. So that's interesting, right? It's like we have to suffer in order to find divinity. In yoga, we know that when there is suffering, there is a stillness of mind. One of my original teachers in my the method of yoga that I practice, Ashtanga, a man named David Garig, he told us once a story where he asked Guruji, our, our guru who is no longer with us, he said, Guruji, is it necessary for this practice to be so painful? The practice of Ashtanga yoga is very, very painful. And Guruji said, yes, because pain is real. Pain is real. When we're in states of ecstasy or joy, we're not grasped that much in reality than when we're humbled by pain. And through that pain and suffering, then we can find redemption in God. Lection 38 is Jesus, Jesus commandeth the ill treatment of animals. And some of his disciples came and told him of a certain Egyptian, a son of Belial, who taught that it was lawful to torment animals if their suffering brought any profit to men. And Jesus said unto them, Verily I say unto you, they who partake of benefits which are gotten by wronging one of God's creatures cannot be righteous, nor can they touch holy things or teach the mysteries of the kingdom, whose hands are stained with blood, for whose mouths are defiled with flesh. God giveth the grains and the fruit of the earth for food, and for righteous men truly there is no other lawful substance for the body. The robber who breaketh into the house made by man is guilty, but they who break into the house made by God, even of the least of these are the greater sinners. That's pretty powerful. I'm going to read that again. The robber who breaketh into the house made by man is guilty, but they who break into the house made by God, even to the least of these are the greater sinners. When we take a life, that's a body, that's a life created by God. We're a greater sinner than anybody who breaks into a man's house. That's powerful. Whatever I say unto all who desire to be my discipline, keep your hands from bloodshed and let no flesh meat enter your mouths. For God is just and bountiful, who ordaineth that man shall live by the fruits and the seed of the earth alone. For if any animal suffer greatly, and if its life be a misery unto it, or it be dangerous to you, release it from its life quickly and with as little pain as you can. Send it forth in love and mercy, but torment it not. And God the Father will show mercy unto you as you have shown mercy unto those given into your hands. So basically, yeah, if you have to mercy kill something, there you go. And whatsoever ye do unto the cast of these, my children, ye do it unto me. So he's saying that again, that what you do to the animals, you do to me as well. For I am in them and they are in me. Ye, I am in all creatures and all creatures are in me. In all their joys, I rejoice with all their afflictions. I am afflicted. Wherever I say unto you, be you kind to one another and to all creatures of God. So that goes back again to the first section of his birth story, where it became very clear that he wanted to be born in a manger amongst the animals. Lection 39, the seven parables of the kingdom of heaven. Again, Jesus was sitting under the fig tree and his disciples gathered around him and around them came a multitude of people to hear him and said unto him, whereunto shall I liken the kingdom of heaven? And he spoke this parable saying, the kingdom of heaven is like a certain seed, small among seeds, which a man taketh and soweth in his field. But when it grows, it becometh a great tree with sheddeth forth its branches all around, which again shooting downward into the earth, take root and grow upward till the field is covered by the tree so that the birds of the air come and lodge in the branches thereof and the creatures of the earth find shelter beneath it. 
Another parable put he forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like unto the great treasure hidden afield, that which when a man findeth, he hideth, and for the joy thereof goeth and selleth all that he hath to buy the field, knowing how great will be the wealth therefrom. Again is the kingdom of heaven like one pearl of great price, which is found by a merchant seeking goodly pearls. And the merchant finding it, selleth all that he hath to buyeth it, knowing how many more times it is worth than that which he gave for it. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a woman who taketh the incorporable leaven and hideth it in three measures of mill till the whole is leavened and being baked by fire becometh one loaf. Or again, to one who taketh a measure of pure wine and poureth it into two or four measures of water till the whole being mingled becoming the fruit of the vine. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a city built four square on top of a high hill and established on a rock and strong in its surrounding wall and its towers and its gates, which lie to the north, to the south, to the east and to the west. Such a city falleth not, neither can it be hidden, and its gates are open unto all who, having the keys, will enter therein. And he spoke another parable, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like unto good seed that man sowed in his field. But in the night, while the man slept, his enemy came and sowed terrace among the wheats and went his way. But when the blade sprung up and brought forth fruit in the ear, there appeared the terrans also. And the servants of the householder came upon him and said, Sir, didst thou not sow good seed in thy field, whence then hath it tares? And he said unto them, An enemy hath done this. And the servant said unto him, Wilt thou then that we go and gather them up? And he said, Nay, least happily, why ye gather up the tares, yet root up the good wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. And in the time of the harvest, I will say to the reapers, Gather up the first tares, and behind them in the bundles, to burn them and enrich the soil, and gather the wheat into my barn. And again he spoke, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like unto the sowing of the seed. Behold, a sower went forth to sow, and he showed some of the seeds failed by the wayside, and the fowls of the air came and devoured them. And the others fell upon the rocky places into much earth, and straight away they sprang up, because they had no deepness of earth. And when the sun was risen, they were scorched, and because they had no root, they wilted away. And others fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked them. And then others fell upon good ground, ready, prepared, and yielded fruit, some hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty, when they have ears to hear, let them hear. Lection 40, Jesus expands his inner teaching to the twelve. And the disciples came and said unto him, Why speakest thou unto the multitude in parables? He answered and said unto them, Because it is given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it is not given. For whoever hath to him shall be given, and he shall have more abundance. But whoever hath not from him shall be taken away that which he seemeth to have. Therefore I speak to them in parables, because they seeing me not, and hearing they hear not, neither do they understand. For in them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isis, or Isaac, which saith, Hearing ye shall hear, and ye shall not understand, and seeing ye shall see, and shall not perceive. For this people's heart is waxed gross, and their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes have been closed. Least at any time they should see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and should understand with their heart, and should be covered, and I should heal them. But blessed are your eyes, for they see, and your ears, for they hear, and your hearts, for they understand. For verily I say unto you, that many prophets and righteous men have desired to see those things which ye see, and had not seen them, and hear those things which ye hear, and have not heard them. Then Jesus sent the multitude away, and his disciples came unto him, saying, Declare unto us the parable of the field. And he answered and said unto them, That he soweth the good sea is the son of man, the field is the world, and the good sea are children of the kingdom. But the tars are the children of the wicked one, and the enemy that sowed them is the devil. And the harvest is in the end of the world, and the reapers are the angels." 
As therefore the tars are gathered and burned in the fire, so shall it be at the end of the world. The Son of Man shall set forth his angels, and they shall gather out of his kingdom all things that offended, and then which do iniquity, and shall cast them into the furnace of fire, and they who will not be purified shall be utterly consumed. Then shall the righteous shine forth, and the sun in the kingdom of heaven." Hear you also the parable of the sower. The seed that fell by the wayside is like as when you hear the word of the kingdom and understand it not. Then cometh the wicked one and catch away that which was sown in their heart. These are they which receive seed by the wayside. And that they receive the seed into the stony place, the same are they that hear the word, the anon, with joy receive it. Yet have they not root in themselves, but endure only a while. For when the tribulation or persecution ariseth because of the word, by and by they are offended. They also that receive seed among the thorns are they that hear the word, and the cares of this world and the decent deceitfulness of riches choke the word, and they become unfruitful. But they, but they that receive the seed into the good ground are they that hear the word and understand it, who also bear the fruit, bring forth some thirty, some sixty, some hundredfold. These things I declare unto you of my inner circle, but to those of the outer parables, let them hear who have ears to hear. So those last two lections to me are basically everything that's going on in our world today too. Like there are so many underlying truths we see and coming out of this matrix like those of us who can see it can see it whereas many other people do not they are clutched in the deceptions of the third density as we move into the fifth density so that's where we're stopping on lection 40 that was a long episode and if you've made it that that this far then congratulations again if you want to see a further breakdown of these gospels these verses please head over to the dark outpost tv.com there is a link down in the description box below thank you again to josh mckay for doing our intro music if you would like to purchase this the full song then there is also a link in the description box below and thank you to todd roderick for helping me get this video out to you guys today i hope you have a wonderful day and i will talk to you soon bye